Okay, so what other uh, topics uh, would anybody like to suggest? Um, we did also see some resurgence of that shared realm intrinsics on the language repo. We could probably discuss that briefly. Yes, our, oh, the, the, th the thread on the language repo where Alan Wurstbrock was uh, um, uh, where his understanding was very stale compared to where we are now on realms. I believe so, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I am going to find that document I mentioned and bring it up on the shared screen. Uh, where is it? Okay, here we go. While you're doing that, I think there's a tangentially related sort of issue with respect to promise pipelining. Um, oh, okay. Based on some of the stuff I overheard at uh, the last TC39 meeting, which is there is a subset of folks who are kind of, I don't understand this, therefore it's of no use. And um, I think there's a, a communications challenge um, that might be worth addressing at some point. Don't know that we have to talk about it today, but I wanted to throw it out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, say, say more about that. Um, various folks, particularly um, Gus Kaplan, I think, um, expressing skepticism about promise pipelining that seemed to be rooted in, 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 not in the, uh, I, I, you know, I think there's a better way to do this or, well, he kind of does say that a little bit, but, um, but more in the, well, I don't see what the point of this is, therefore. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's one thing to, to be opposed to something on grounds that you have a, you have a, a reasoned argument or you think some other approach is better or you think it will do harm in some way, you have some, some concept of, 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 of what it is you don't want. But there's, a, there's another kind of more um, sort of vague, uh, uh, um, I don't have a use for this and I don't understand this, therefore um, um, this shouldn't be here. Um, uh, so, so I'm, um, if, if you, characterize the position uh, slightly softer, I'm, I have a lot of sympathy for it. Well, which in, is in, in terms of in terms of let's not clutter up with with stuff. Um, but there is a and, and let's only move forward on something. If there's a strong case that it serves uses that are worth serving right which is which right. is which is different than i have a use for it um right but um but as long as they're open to argument that other people have a use for it and it's sufficiently strong to be compelling uh i think that's you know that that is something that well, we and, should and, need to satisfy them of and and, and that, that i'll be right be, back that may be in fact the the proper rhetorical approach here which is not to attempt to you know explain in more detail and with more earnestness how this works and 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 so forth and what it is but rather to have a better uh, explication of use cases or potential use cases or you know going into more depth about what things this empowers or enables that weren't previously available or were available only at, at enormous um, effort yeah, um, so that, that actually suggests a very uh, so, I think, potential uh, certainly, fruitful area of communication. Yeah, uh, so uh, in general, the explainers of, of a proposal try to 
um, motivate it. And I think that given the skepticism you're talking about, uh, we should in fact put more effort into motivating the promise pipelining. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. I would also see the um, um, any rebuttal or or um, um, maybe resistance in the, in the broader term as a just a reality check, and um, it's um, there's obviously something in the communication that could be improved. Maybe use cases, but also um, explain uh, the barrier of entry. I think that uh, it's not only the, the how useful it is, but also the barrier of entry to this world compared to doing something similar um, and what it could replace in uh, in uh, the current implementation people are having whenever they have to uh, um, have remote the equivalent of a remote execution. I think it's the question of building those use cases and say, you know, this is an example of the old way and uh, this is the different approach that we're, we're, we're suggesting. And here you can view for yourself the difference and you can uh, understand uh, and maybe and bridge that application to your own application. I think something to add here too is that there's a healthy disregard, well, maybe an unhealthy disregard for history in the JavaScript world. And uh, I think the past couple of presentations, we focused mostly on the history of how problems pipelining came to be. And I think to some people that'll just go right over their heads and they, they immediately disregard stuff like that. <laughs> right, that, that we have decades of practice and experience that tells us this is a, an, uh, 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 an empowering pattern, does not carry a lot of weight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so I appreciate that point. Uh, in general, um, uh, I think the committee is, you know, in general, I would like to encourage the committee to be more skeptical yes. uh, that uh, proposals are useful. Yes, no, I demand I, I, a higher, I, higher bar on that. I, I, I share that, that perspective more generally in, in the sense that I see a lot of stuff um, brought before uh, the committee that are like, something which would be a, a, a minor convenience for somebody at the expense of further complication of the, the language. Um, and, uh, and, and, and therefore this, you know, well, that's great and all, but does it carry its weight? I think is a perfectly legitimate pushback on any proposal. And I think it, 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 it is our obligation to address that. But uh, at the same time, um, you know, acknowledging it's our obligation to address that, we, we ought to actually address it. Yeah. There was a generation um, uh, where uh, it would not have been possible to push this forward because everybody believed that distributed objects could not work. Uh, the, right. the big relief now is um, uh, most people on the committee were born late enough that they have no memory of CORBA. <laughs> well, the other thing, Corbett, though, is Corbett, I think Corbett Corbett just wipe, wiped out the possibility of distributed objects for that generation. Yeah, I had to forget Corba before it could come back. That's 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 a very nice observation. Although I think there's a there's a there's a um, it's not a similar effect, but there is a kind of a um, you know your imagination is somewhat limited by what you know phenomenon, which is that everybody uh, to a first approximation. Uh, most people are rooted in the web. And even if they're doing um, node stuff, they're mostly doing it in the context of serving things over the web. Um, and, and the web is very, um, very strongly structured around this uh, synchronous request response paradigm. And, um, and now we're talking about um, something which is, which is not that, and it's unfamiliar. And the thing that I think it really is is killer for me, but this is this is you know my particular set of hobby horses, is once you start bringing in um, an entity that has been interacted with simultaneously by more than one client, um, um, you know multi-user applications, for example, um, uh, this becomes a lot more 
um, uh, uh, salient, but it's not a thing that people in the web generally do. So it's just not on the radar. Yeah, the other thing is that uh, the reason why now is because we're expecting weak references soon. But right. we, don't, we don't actually have weak references today. So, um, uh, you know, we, we, you know M Michael has created not just a shim of uh, the, event, the proposal, but also a shim of the CAPTP, not a shim, but has created the CAPTP library that sits on top of our Marshall uh, library that uh, does the serialization and serialization of, me of messages on top of a transport to bring about the remote communication. <coughs> but for actual industrial use without weak references, it'll run into the same roadblock that Q connection ran into. Right. Which, which is just, you know, after a while, it just leaks too many table entries. So we can't quite demonstrate yet that this proposal satisfies a huge industrial need because we can't actually satisfy it yet. Right, right. Okay. Is there, is there a subset that you can satisfy uh, correctly? Uh, so um, yes. Uh, it's basically where the interaction is short-lived enough that the, or at least the connection is short-lived enough, that the fact that the table tables only grow during the connection, um, uh, if they don't grow too much uh, during the lifetime of a short-lived connection, uh, then those uses would be practical. Yeah, mm -hmm. also there are, uh, now, now we're kind of wandering uh, uh, fairly far afield, but um, I've, I've certainly built several generations of systems that just don't use the, the table model that we, that we have. Um, oh, that's a and, good point. And, and we just work on different principles. And they also rely on, on the fact that the entity you're interacting with is going to be uh, short-lived. Um, uh, but short-lived in the, in, in the, in the scope of, you know, you know, hours rather than um, uh, seconds as is the case with typical web applications. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, you know, memories are big enough that I suspect that, that a, a lifetime limit of hours is enough for a tremendous amount of successful usage. Well, yes. In particular, if, if you're not having a lot of, um, uh, object creation going on, uh, then, then, um, beyond, beyond whatever initialization of the, the, the application is, um, then you can, you can go quite a long time. Mm -hmm. I would expect that, um, some frameworks could benefit of, uh, of that system and could be a good demo. Um, yeah, I, I, I have, um, I have amb um, ambitions to, to reconstruct Elko um, in, in, in this, in this environment. So we can have a What is Elko? Hmm? What is Elko? Elko is the um, highly scalable um, multi-user application uh, framework that I've been maintaining for several years. It's optimized <laughs> for things like uh, massively multiplayer online games. Okay. I, I'd be really curious to hear from JF because he, of all of us here, is probably the person who's had the most experience using CAPTP, but not having grown up with it. <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, I, see, I, I see. Yeah, I see a benefit with um, that to uh, power uh, what has been done by the Meteor framework, which is. Um, um, to have a persistent connection between the client and the server and uh, try to do that with uh, where the two system, uh, the client and the server, basically appear to work as one unit and there is no, um, there's no 
um, the, the 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 space between the two is tried to be abstracted. So um, yeah, maybe there's something to do there. That's that's why I was asking if um, something like Meteor, which you know is very novel in the terms still today in the terms of, of, of single web application. It's uh, it was a revolution when it came out, and uh, but I think that the technology that they're using um, might not be uh, might not have progressed to other frameworks because it's hard to abstract it from ADR. Um, if uh, CapTP was used in that environment, maybe then the, uh, that would be the first use case and then others would be able to uh, take the subset that they need and, and port it to other frameworks. I just realized that other distributed object systems like Cap and Proto establish the utility of distributed objects in general and <clears throat> and our framework um, uh, we should actually look to see how natural a mapping we can do um, mm. uh, from JavaScript eventual sends onto uh, the elements of Cap and Proto certainly there's a very the the uh, there's a very natural mapping to what you can express in the cap and proto idl yeah i think that's that's an excellent idea um does i haven't looked at cap and proto in quite a while is there um, any basis for thinking that it can benefit from uh promise pipelining or are those things completely orthogonal uh no cap and proto actually uh, did all of the protocol work for Promise Pipelining and their language endpoints uh, uh, oh, okay. make use of that. So, so oh, Promise good. Pipelining was was one of the um, the main features that um, Kenton used to advertise uh, the Cap and Proto um, uh, object communication line. Oh, okay. I guess I see. Um, the only downside with Cap and Proto is that uh, Sandstorm being the main client that was using it. Uh, they only developed the libraries to the extent that they actually need it. And uh, it's, it's good, but as, as you know, there is no JavaScript implementation of it because it's got too much bookkeeping. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm They've, going to, is there a way to suspend recording? Sure, I'll do that. Uh, Um, the other big feature missing from um, uh, uh, Michael's CAP TP is a three party handoff. Um, the, um, and the support for three party handoff in CAP and Proto uh, is, my impression is that it's either non existent or not in a good state. Um, but Cap'n Pro is certainly architected uh, uh, in anticipation of good support for three-party handoff. Many industrial uses of distributed objects don't need full three-party handoff. They can continue to just proxy through the introducers. And for many, many uses, that'll be fine. Just not for the the what what you know agoric will need something more because we need to um, get checkable object identity of objects arriving through multiple connections, and for that you need you need the three full three party handoff. Um, uh, I propose. Well, let me, first of all, uh, we have a new member, uh, Jack Works. Um, uh, Jack and I have been in communication uh, by email and on GitHub threads. Uh, and Jack and I are now also the co-champions of a proposal that we're going to be presenting at the upcoming uh, TC39 meeting um, uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, named something like uh, make all built-in functions strict. Uh, there's right now the spec is not uh, 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 specific enough uh, about making sure that built-in functions are treated 
the same way that that uh, strict functions are treated with regard to weird platform dangerous reflective operations like caller. And um, uh, Jack, would you like to um, say more, or introduce yourself, or? Okay, hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Jack Fox from Suji Tech, and um, I'm working on a browser extension. And in that extension, um, I need some um, some way to create a sandbox for the iOS uh, um, polyfill purpose. Uh, I currently use the ROM stream to do that job, and um, I wrapped it, the DOM API into the ROMs API, um, but it cannot protect the DOM um, polyfill, uh, um, um, I mean, DOM prototype to the outside of the sandbox and inside of the sandbox. So uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. So let me uh, make sure I understand that um, uh, the language element of creating the sandbox, uh, leaving aside the browser API, uh, that just um, uh, creating the language sandbox, um, uh, that's working for you. But in order to make use of the, the language sandbox, the way you want to in the browser, uh, you need to um, uh, do a safe interface uh, to the uh, to the functionality of the DOM API. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so the Kaha project uh, was the first to do that. That's where that's where Seth was born back in the uh, ECMAScript five days, um, and we uh -huh. did a a full and Kaha is basically all open source. So all of this is available to take a look at. Uh, we did a uh, uh, layer called Domato um, that was a basically an ad hoc handcrafted membrane for the entire uh, browser a API as it was in that era, um, the ECMAScript 5 era. Um, and uh, that was successful. Uh, and was used to protect some large systems, but it was much too hard, much too manual, and was not able to keep up with uh, changes to the HTML spec. Um, uh, Salesforce, more recently, um, uh, has done uh, something, has actually done several experiments to do something uh, like Domato, uh, uh, but with less manual work. and. Uh, nobody from Salesforce, nobody who's currently in Salesforce is in on this call, but JF of Agoric uh, was recently at Salesforce and was central to that effort. Um, can you type the name of that um, framework? I can't. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the, the framework um, is uh, the Lightning framework. Um, that's the current version of it. Um, but um, the the equivalent of the Domato or the DOM API uh, inside of a realm is uh, something called Locker. And Locker is used to be part of an, was something that people made um, as part of the previous framework, kind of an extension and, and people thought it was, would be a very simple API. So it grew up as part of the Aura framework and when I was at Salesforce, I isolated it. I, I took it out uh, so could abstract it and apply it to the new framework. Um, so in terms of open source, uh, we never got the approval to uh, publish uh, Locker by itself. However, you can still, um, because of the way things were published at the time, if you go to the Aura framework uh, repository, which is, uh, which is closed, uh, it, it's archived, it's static, you can still get at uh, the, uh, the build 
of that uh, of that code and it's published under the, uh, the apache license so you, you should take a look and it's on it's on github um now that framework is um is uh when i took it it was the result of various experiments um so the different parts of the name dumb api are implemented in very different ways uh, but uh, if you uh, want to have a look at it, uh, if you want some pointers, uh, ping me and I'll I can uh, give you a walkthrough of how it, how it's how it's working and and uh, maybe to uh, show you uh, Locker uh, the good parts. Um, can you send a link in the chat so I can yes. check out it later? Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, another special part of my use age is that I want to keep the, I'm simulating the Firefox behavior on the extension that's called X revision. And I want to make sure in the sandbox, um, I always see the real, the raw DOM and I, um, the code run in the sandbox is safe and the code out of the sandbox are dangerous. So I need to prevent the outside world to pollute the sandbox code or the DOM code to affect the code run inside the sandbox. Can you repeat that? I, I, don't, I don't think I got that one. Um, the code run in the sandbox are assumed to be safe and the code outside of the sandbox are dangerous. So my in my use case, I want to ensure that the code outside the sandbox cannot pollute the um, sandbox framework itself and nor and not pollute the DOM prototype to attack the code inside the sandbox. That's usually difficult because very often the, the world outside has control on the sand, sandbox. You know, the, 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 the sandbox itself is created by the code outside, but yeah. Yes, uh, I think um, collecting every reference the sandbox code use can maybe resolve this problem. Right. Interesting. You should see the link there of the build, the uh, completed okay. the library. So this is a standalone file. It, it still has some APIs that are um, wrapping it and making it um, uh, making the, the facade or the interface to Aura, to the old framework. Uh, but in it, you will see um, um, uh, the secure window, the secure document, and all of the uh, biggest objects that were reified as, uh, as an attenuator over the uh, non-secure one. There's also secure element, which is a um, generic element object which can depending on what it's gonna um, proxify in a way it's proxified without a proxy um, it will um, be able to take the form of any of the subclasses of uh, element so it could be an html element it could be a html div element and, and, and so on Part of it is also um, metadata driven. So by reading a JSON file,
so um, uh, I propose we switch to the uh, draft document, uh, the compartment spec experiment. And um, uh, Dan Finley of MetaMask just joined us. Uh, Dan, we have a new member in Jack Works, and uh, 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 MetaMask is also uh, with uh, um, uh, MetaMask is also a browser extension uh, that that has adopted CES. So, uh, and that's what I understand. Uh, Jack is is Jack's use of CES is in the context of a browser extension. Cool. What's the name of that extension? Mm, our next, uh, our extension is called Maskbook. Oh, Maskbook. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Okay, I'm familiar. Um, oh, great. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the re-encryption of uh, Facebook posts, uh, making it a private site. Yeah, uh, I I would love eventually to be able to support the Maskbook protocol as a MetaMask extension. We actually have an issue about uh, where we've discussed. The potential of doing something like that. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, uh, JF and I um, have been uh, working uh, on this document that's um, titled Compartment Spec Experiment. And uh, the origin of this is the uh, XS compartment API. Um, uh, which was a simplified API for doing CES with safe modules, uh, uh, simplified in the sense that um, uh, that the that the uh, ability of it to flexibly express various consider con configurations of uh, safe modules. Uh, it's not intended to be fully expressive, but rather it's intended to uh, cover the 95% case with a simple declarative interface. I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, uh, so we wanted to start with the XS one uh, and then evolve it into something that corresponds to uh, our modern understanding of the, uh, the kind of SES concepts we want and the modularity among them. Uh, while still enabling XS to adopt it uh, with incremental work to uh, their current engine. And, um, and we're uh, also doing this using a language that is, uh, or pseudocode that's very similar to the language uh, specs of, right. the, of, uh, of uh, ECMA. Um, that allows us to reuse or try to reuse concepts that are, are familiar uh, to anybody who writes a specs and, and it allows a much easier uh, detection of where we could uh, see similarities in, in the current system and where we, we need to um, be careful of, of semantic that could change as clear about. Yeah, so... Um... Uh, so the document that um, uh, that JF had done before I got in there and fiddled was much closer to actual spec language. And when I, as I evolved it into what I'm about to talk about, um, you'll see some places where I just took shortcuts rather than staying with the spec language. But but yeah, the intention of this is that uh, what it specifies, it, it does in... Um, a way that, um, you know, in spec language such that uh, at the upcoming TC39 meeting, um, uh, if this is stable well before then, and if Modable uh, agrees that this is implementable uh, within their system, within their direct CES implementation, uh, then uh, I'm hoping to um, propose that SES with this API and with this language, uh, move to stage two. So this is a candidate, a you know, draft for a candidate stage two. So the um, key insight here 
is that is to make the compartment constructor, uh, um, I'm sorry, to make the compartment instance um, uh, very close, be very close to the current realm concept of what the spec, I'm sorry, the current spec concept of what the spec unfortunately calls a realm record. Uh, there's a tremendous renaming problem with regard to the current spec, uh, which is um, uh, sometimes it uses the term realm for what we would currently talk of as an evaluator or as a compartment. And sometimes it uses it for what we would currently call a realm. Um, uh, uh, so over here, the only realm wide concept is the one that's shown as the internal slot named intrinsics, which is the shared intrinsics, uh, which is also an internal slot of the realm record. Uh, of the five internal slots shown here for a compartment instance, uh, the first four of them are all uh, internal slots of what the spec calls a realm record. Uh, the realm record is, of course, is a internal spec concept, not reified. Whereas our proposal is to reify the compartment instance, um, uh, carrying all those um, same slots, uh, and then to um, to use it where we need um, a, the same kind of uh, context for evaluating code, which is really the purpose of the realm record. Um, yeah. We've we've added to it this concept of an import map, but haven't said much concrete in this document as to what we mean by an import map. Um, uh, and it could be as simple as a mapping from string name to string name, uh, or it could be, it could potentially be something that, that grows more into uh, Michael's flexible loader concept, what would be um, uh, incrementally adoptable by excess would be something much closer to just a simple string to string mapping. Uh, so currently in excess, um, the import map is a, um, is a string to symbol and um, the symbol hides the um, actual uh, module or, or that is uh, um, referenced. But uh, some of the assumptions that the XS work, that drove the XS work and the, their design of the API suitable for them that we're trying to preserve here uh, while still being um, suitable for unconstrained environments uh, is that in the XS typical scenario, all of the modules that might be run, all of the so source code for those modules is preloaded be before any compartments are created. So that, um, uh, so there's sort of this, this prior configuration step that has named all of the modules that might ever be uh, instantiated and linked together. So the compartment API is there to create um, uh, support for uh, least authority uh, instantiation and linkage of modules by controlling the global namespace and the import namespace that each module sees and controlling how they're wired to each other. Um, uh, but it all takes place after um, uh, module source text has been turned into uh, some static notion of loaded module. Uh, and this proposal also does not reify what that static notion of loaded module is. Uh, it assumes behind the scenes that, um, uh, that there's some, you know, um, that in the processing of module imports, there's something that turns absolute module specifiers um, into um, uh, something that satisfies an import. 
Um, and so the control here is just the control of um, uh, mapping the absolute module specifiers uh, that come out of the, uh, how to put this, um, that are part of the module namespace of a given compartment. Um, we think of that as going through a, ma an, a mapping to some more original set of absolute specifiers in very much the same way that an, an MMU uh, maps from virtual addresses to physical addresses. Uh, the mapping also controls what you can address because you can only address those physical addresses uh, that uh, for which, um, uh, you know, that, that are in the range of that mapping. Uh, also, like an MMU, you don't know what the physical addresses are. You just know what virtual addresses you can say. Um, in, in the case of an MMU, it's basically a single mapping, whereas a if I read this correctly, this could be a mapping to something which then has its own mapping to something else, which has its own mapping to something else. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, the, so yeah. the way to think about that analogy is nested virtual machines. Okay. Okay. If you if you run an operate if you run a operating system on top of a virtual machine running on an operating system, uh, then you've got an emulated MMU running on top of the physical MMU where the emulated MMU, what it thinks of as a physical address is actually another level of virtual address uh, yeah. on top of the underlying MMU. An MMMU. Yeah. And so, so also looking at this and, and feel free to, to just push back that this is a distraction from where you're going with this. Um, I see global object and global environment um, is that a factoring that is inherited from the older realm spec or, or, or realm record spec language, or is it some new thing? No, that's, that's inherited. Okay. Uh, the, the distinction there is that the global environment is the thing that's consulted to yeah. dereference a Sorry. name. Sorry. Uh, sorry, guys, I'm going to mute. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, the, uh, hi, Salah. Um, uh, oh, hey, guys. Sorry, I'm using a crappy Mac, and I didn't realize I was uh, unmuted on joining. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. Great. Um, okay. So, uh, that's a, that, so the, the distinction between global environment and, and global object exists in the spec. Uh, given the use we're making of it, we, I, don't, I, did, I didn't see that there was anything we needed to change about that. We just needed to adopt it in the right place. Uh, so, and, and the difference is that when you say global this, the, thing, the object that you're getting is the global object, whereas when you dereference a free variable name, the global environment is the lexical environment object that uh, the, you know, the internal spec concept of what it is that's responsible for dereferencing the variable name. Okay. And, okay. It, and then it's within the logic of the global environment that the means by which global variables are aliased to properties of the global object, that's all magic performed by the global environment object. Ah. So it's more like the global object is a data structure, the global environment is an object that does things. That's right, that's oh. right. And so, so one of the, the things here, there's sort of two, you've got kind of two different concurrent refactorings going on. You've got the, the realms to realms and compartments transition. And then you've got whatever it is you're, you're doing that's a delta from the excess spec. Um, right. Is there a great and, way to disentangle those? Uh, no, it's, a, we're, I mean, uh, we're trying for a simultaneous solution uh, such that what we're proposing uh, is also a decent proposal, is a proposal that is justifiable on its own merits 
even if you don't care about excess. Okay. Very good. Uh, so, yeah. uh, uh, we're using excess as a, as a probe, like you've done some uh, legwork that is, uh, we can learn from, and um, it's, it helps us move further than just um, uh, going conceptually and trying to emulate with clever JavaScript a new environment. Um, they have done this in, uh, in, in C language and they were able to uh, express concept like a realm record in ways that uh, we cannot do in JavaScript. Yeah. Um, so the other, the so the third element of the refactoring uh, is um, uh, to bring more of the mechanics of the import namespace into the spec as well as into the API um, because. The notion of import map doesn't correspond to anything in the spec because the spec is really silent on how relative specifiers get turned into modules. They leave all of that to the host. Um, and in order to, so we're trying to do the minimal there um, uh, that still enables us to meet the security goals of SES. The security goals of SES really require uh, enough control of remapping that namespace that um, compartment A can create compartment B um, where compartment B is completely confined and its import namespace is, um, uh, you know, is, can, can't contain anything that uh, A did not already have or, or that A was not able to give it. Uh, uh, and uh, can use whatever names uh, A determines B, B should see it through. Uh, uh, the, um, so one, one further part of the simultaneous solution we're trying for here is I think Michael with his make importer um, that we've touched on in previous meetings is doing a great job at coming up with kind of the minimal necessary set of composable concepts to give us the full expressivity uh, that you want for safe modules. Uh, this one's trying to do a 90% case, 95% case. So I, I should just interject that Sala was the original architect of those composable abstractions. <laughs> okay. So I implemented. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, yes, yeah, so, so Sala and Michael. Um, um, yeah, but you're being very humble, Michael, thanks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry to interrupt again, Mark. <laughs> okay, I, I will just attribute it to both of you. Um, uh, but in any case, uh, so that's trying to cover the 100% case, the, the, the full expressiveness of all of the knobs you'd like to be able to turn uh, programmatically. Uh, what this is trying to express is the and, and when I say 95% case, I mean that as a metaphor. I don't mean that as something that was measured. Um, but um, uh, so the other thing that's trying to do a declarative covering of the 95% case are the tofu-based configuration tools uh, that Bradley has been working on for Node and that uh, Dan and Kumavis have been working on for MetaMask. Uh, they're very similar forms of configuration file. Uh, also, Kate and I had a manual sketch of something that we did for the to-do list example. Um, and that also uh, tries to use JSON as a data declaration of a set of mappings that are uh, programmer customizable to express least authority decisions uh, and which are again, only intended to cover the 95% case. So one of the goals here is that they be the same 95% case. In other words, that a program that interprets one of those configuration files, that we should be able to write that program so that it acts on those configuration files using nothing more than this API in order to set up the execution environment that those configuration files describe. 
There's almost a one-to-one -one mapping there because the module map and the uh, endowments have a direct uh, uh, equivalent in in the uh, tofu kind of environment. So which is nice. I'm wondering how much of this ends up being, and, and once again, I'm thinking about sort of the standards process um, yeah. uh, seen as sort of necessary further refinement of the module spec versus, <laughs> versus um, placing constraints on implementers that the implementers hadn't previously signed up to. So what were well, the think things, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I would say that uh, I, I think we, um, I would say that the refinement of the module spec is, is a euphemism in the way that uh, um, the uh, module spec is, is quite confusing the way it is. And um, it might not even be implemented the way it's specified. Um, I'm currently taking a look at um, what the module is doing because um, I believe that the specs cannot be implemented in module considering uh, the uh, frozen aspect uh, that uh, they introduce. And one thing that Michael and, and Sally um, um, module system is trying to do is separate a, uh, a static record versus a linkage record, record. And so far, my understanding of access is they have come to realization that it's necessary. And I'm doing the same exercise uh, for that, that um, I've done for, for the compartment API, trying to express that aspect. And I believe that uh, in a subsequent me meeting, we'll have a clear uh, um, picture of that but it's most likely that we will have to um, evolve uh, the module specs. Yeah, I was, I was actually less thinking about um, uh, the, the modable folks who are, I think, 100% on board with getting all of this sorted out um, as the rest of the world. Oh yeah, how, how to sell it, yeah. It, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, it, you know, um, I would expect that they have made some um, some choices for optimization. The, I think the current way it's expressed in the spec is is not very performant, so there could be some uh, shortcut that they have done. Um, likewise, um, uh, one example of those kind of shortcut is uh, the idea that uh, we were discussing on uh, on the specs website uh, with uh, which regards to Bradley's uh, proposal to uh, allow reusing a realm record for a compartment and making uh, an adjustment on the lookup of the intrinsic. It's something that by accident or by reading, <laughs> talking to Bradley, Access uh, has done. And in their world, a uh, compartment is completely backed up by a, a realm record. It has its own realm record, except that uh, their realm record doesn't have an intrinsic slot. And the reason uh, that doesn't exist at all in excess is that intrinsic, there's only one set of intrinsic in the whole engine. And each item, uh, there's no intrinsic bag, and each item is a is a global. Each one of the name intrinsic is a global object to all modules. So uh, it's it's imagine that uh, ex, uh, we were to follow Bradley's uh, uh, proposal, excess would have nothing to do. Um, so based on that, I would say that it would be interesting to enter a conversation with other. Uh, engine implementers regarding modules because the gap might be closer than we think. Yes, and I'll, that makes sense. That makes that makes sense. Yeah. Also, I was thinking just in terms of, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of of uh, um, uh, leeway left to the host implementers in in the module spec, and um, you know, on the one hand. Uh, sort of uh, narrowing that down and kind of being a little bit more prescriptive, a little bit more rigorous, kind of constrains their options. But on the other hand, it may also, um, they're also in a situation where they would like their options to be constrained in order to have 
to know that they can they can correctly uh, employ various optimization strategies um, and and yeah. therefore um, being more precise about what exactly is going on actually makes their lives easier um, yeah. yeah and I, and I would add the third concern there which uh, which was discussed on that thread with, with Bradley is that um, if um, the, all of those operations I said, do some kind of magic uh, in the host in order to achieve uh, end result. Um, it's very difficult to reason along those uh, host provided operation in terms of security uh, um, um, parameters because we don't know what the implementation is. Well, also, and on top of the two, the two concern that you, you bring is having a more uh, something that's more prescribed um, uh, gives us more. Um, ways to make a cert, uh, security uh, assertions. Well, the, the security analysis is, is clearly central to our, our own interests. I think there's also, I suspect, um, the TEST 262 people may have some opinions here, just in terms of to the more the, the ex, greater the extent that the behavior can be characterized precisely, the greater the extent to which tests can be constructed, which will yeah. you know, be doing it or not. Yeah, this is so, this is interesting because it. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Uh, give yeah. me some room there, Michael. So, so I just wanted to say for the implementers that don't want to be overly constrained, uh, they basically have the option of saying our platform does not support compartments, and then they can be where they were. No, uh, that's that's um, what I, I was not planning to propose that compartments be normative optional. I was oh, planning okay. to propo propose that they be normative. No, we want the, them normative because we want them in the browser. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. It would be interesting if every, if every script tag in the browser was a compartment, right? So. In the same way that, that you know, you can potentially uh, load, you know, you can certainly, you know, in the same way you can load different modules into different compartments, you should be able to load different scripts into different compartments. Right. Um, uh, the um, now the the so but but so okay so 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 this conversation brings uh, some more constraints on the design that are worth stating. Um, uh, there's the the um, uh, the big one that got us here, which is the separation of uh, the notion of multiple realms from the notion of multiple compartments. Uh, when we first proposed realms and compartments. We did it in such a way where the notion of multiple compartments depended on underlying mechanisms and APIs supporting multiple realms. These are now completely separated. Uh, Caridi yeah. is separately working on the realms proposal, which is only about multiple realms. Uh, and as JF mentioned, uh, in this proposal, the realm concept only shows up as the intrinsics and there's only and there's nothing here that introduces a new intrinsic set. It's just reusing some intrinsic set that came in. Um, uh, so in that sense, the Realm API uh, should be, in order for uh, Modable not to have to create multiple root realms, which is quite a burden, just to conform to the spec, I would propose that the realm API be normative optional, uh, so that a um, a host can so that a platform can still be a single realm platform and and conform. Yeah, um, I think I think that's very clean. Well, I think the whole realm versus compartment distinction is very clean. Um, yeah, uh, which and, and 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 clarifies many things. I am wondering though how much. Uh, work is going to be involved in in patching all of the other parts of the spec that just make reference to realm um, or to the realm record um, in in various different places. Uh, all of that's going to have to be re refactored to account for this distinction. And I'm kind of I don't have a sense of how much work that is. It's um, this is where um, Bradley's uh, probe is 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 very interesting. Um, many pl the places where the realm record is used are, is like um, in function evaluation in uh, function in in, in uh, the eval function sorry 
in a, in a constructor. Um, so there's always a reference to a RAM record there. Uh, uh, it might, it, it's only, it doesn't mean it's a realm. It means it's a, it's a bag of, of things that travel together and this is where you can get it. So they use the RAM record in order to, in order to get to the global object. Um, so, and, so, and, and so, so, let, so that could be actually re simply renamed, and uh, then it will lose its its uh, its uh, tie to a realm. It could be a, uh, a compartment. whatever it could be a compartment compartment record, and uh, and then there's the change to the spec uh, seems very minimal uh, uh, in, the, in that sense. Okay, very good. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. let me propose. Let me propose quite explicitly that since this compartment object has all of the internal slots of the realm of what is currently called the realm record, that mm -hmm. what we what we should be explicitly proposing is that all occurrences of the term realm record in the spec mm -hmm. uh, get renamed into compartment exotic object. We don't need a separate internal spec record concept. We can just say the, the compartment exotic object has these fields and it now serves the role that realm record had served. Well, is there, is there some um, uh, higher level thing that distinguishes, that's involved in the distinction of one realm from another? Um, that, that's no, there's no concept in the specs of multiple realms. Uh, um, ah, so, so from except, except that some operations say get the current realm. So there's some operation that uh, seem to have been patched to work in a situation where multiple realms are possible, but the interaction between multiple realm is not defined. Uh, so, so, so in, in essence, all of the places which are talking about the realm are talking about the realm, and, yes. and, and instead they could talk about the compartment and they have essentially the same uh, meaning mm -hmm. um, and anything which was dealing with um, some concept of having multiple realms and managing them that would all be new API anyway with its own new set of stuff to go with it that doesn't doesn't impinge on the, the, mm -hmm. the present state of the world. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think I think the the way to go about this is for each such con yeah we have to examine each concept individually, and uh, you know each occurrence of these terms in the spec to see, yes. and for, each, for each such occurrence, uh, there's there's just one simple question to ask, is is there one of these per realm, or is there one of these per compartment? I think the per yeah. question. Yes. gets at the yeah. essence. I think that is, yeah. that is, yes, that is what I, you just said what I was trying to say more articulately. Yeah. Okay. And for what you're seeing here, the thing that, the, the, the thing that is exactly the per realm concept is the thing that is labeled intrinsics. Yeah. Everything else is per compartment. Right. Right. Which unless, is why uh, Monable yeah, unless, is without having that because it's essentially, it's, it's, um, it's it's because there's only one they don't have to have you know the same thing pointing to it from everywhere it just it's it's global it's a well it's yeah you could virtualize it in essence um to put, yeah. to, to put it in to put it another way uh since there's only one you can represent the internal slot that points at it with zero bits exactly exactly right because you're trying to make a distinction between one thing now the spec in the realm record has a provision for host uh, um, specific slots. Um, oh, it's yes. possible, and it's possible that um, uh, we don't know what those are. I would expect that something like import map, which is uh, something, and then there are other slots that um, that um, um, access it as as has they have a. The realm record has nine slots, uh, so there's. So I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll dig deeper and I'll, I'll come back to this, but I believe that um, this is an area where um, a, a split between uh, whole specific. <laughs> 
uh, slots will have to be uh, uh, divided between the rail record and the component record. Yeah, I think I think you're right that in order for this to slip in uh, as the replacement concept for realm record, uh, I had dropped the host specific field from this uh, uh, th mostly just through lack of attention. Uh, but we got, I, but we need to include it just so that this can be a non-controversial replacement concept. Yeah, and maybe a way to make it even less controversial is to call it by how, what it's called currently. Yes, um, uh, what is it called currently? Host defined. Okay. And uh, it's a field reserved for use by host environment that need to associate additional information via a realm record. And I, I can paste it there. Okay, so I went ahead and added the field. Um, <laughs> Very good. Okay, okay, and then there's one more overriding constraint to this, which is uh, that um, uh, what's, what's shown here can be implemented securely with high confidence by a shim on top of today's JavaScript. Uh, and in fact, uh, the subset of this that, that does not include modules, the subset of this that's just about evaluable scripts uh, is uh, we're going to, we're trying to put together a really hardcore security review of the evaluator shim. Basically, if you take this thing and you remove all the module concepts exactly. and you remove the host defined field, uh, um, what you're left with is essentially the evaluator shim. Yeah, like and you can reify this as, a, as a, um, all of those operations as, as an evaluator, yeah. Yeah, so I think the evaluator shim should be made to conform, I mean, this, this document and the evaluator shim should be brought into alignment. Uh, and then uh, that's what we're going into the security review with. Uh, the reason yeah. why we're omitting modules from the security review uh, is that the only way we know of to get high confidence of security properties uh, on top of today's JavaScript is the eight magic lines of code that only works with the valuable scripts. Uh, and so in order to securely work with module source text uh, on top of today's JavaScript, uh, we have to use a, trans a source, source translator. Uh, Michael Figg's translator is exactly what we need. Um, uh, but uh, that is a set big enough and separate enough as it is that it's beyond the attention budget that I want for this first security review. Yeah, makes sense. But the overall SES shim that we want to promote for people to actually use securely in production uh, should be, you know, uh, that, that we're proposing that it be exactly aligned uh, with this document. So, so we need to revise both this document and the shim with that in mind. Okay. So there's one further really big important insight um, that um, was new to me that I got from looking at um, JF's um, uh, the, the JF's um, writing down the semantics of the XS compartments is that the compartment constructor is not per realm. It's not a member of the intrinsics. There, rather, the compartment constructor is in the category of evaluator, which are per compartment. And, uh, and that means that compartments, it used to be the case that compartments didn't um, have a notion of being in any tree-like relationship to each other. They were just directly contained within their realm. It was basically just a two-level tree 
with with the compartments being the leaves, um, uh, and and um, just delegating to their uh, realm for the intrinsics. Now, a compartment constructor uh, is uh, treated like the function constructor or like the eval function. Uh, we make a new one uh, every time we make a new compartment, a new compartment instance. Uh, so that, that instance create, contains a new compartment constructor. And where this parent concept shows up as significant is the tree of import mappings. Is that um, uh, the child constructor is constructed with a mapping, mapping the import namespace that it is providing to code run uh, in the compartment it creates, uh, that the import map maps those to the import namespace of uh, the parent compartment, the compartment that, that, uh, that um, in which that compartment constructor was found. And by treating it as, by treating the compartment constructor as, uh, as itself something that's created per compartment, we keep that concept lexical and first class. Um, uh, there is a temptation to specify um, uh, this inheriting of context uh, as caller sensitivity, which would be dynamic scoping, which we must not do ever. Um, and rather uh, use lexical capture, and this keeps the lexical capture nature. It doesn't matter who calls the compartment constructor, the question is, which compartment did the compartment constructor come from? And the compartment it came from is the compartment whose, whose import namespace, uh, uh, this compartment constructor maps other import namespaces onto. And it makes the compartment behave like a eval of function. It's tied to a um, an, a, an environment. It, it has an um, like evaluating function have an implied global object um, attached to them. Wherever they are executing, compartment would have the same kind of inheritance. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah, and because even evaluating evaluable scripts in the, um, you know, valuable scripts can contain dynamic import expressions, um, it's still the case that even for evaluable scripts in a full system, the import map is essential because you still have to do the mapping of import namespaces. Yeah, so you don't have a surprise. Exactly. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it, that's interesting because in a way we did have uh, that type of inheritance, but in the realm through the shims. And, and what we were trying to do, um, any new realm would have uh, all the shims of its uh, parent uh, be applied first before uh, it, it begins. Uh, any a new evaluation as a way to preserve um, the how the language was uh, implemented, what kind of authority was given to a new realm, and uh, so that the child uh, could not start over from 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 zero from what the platform was providing and the parent parent was trying to attenuate. Um, now doing do this on the compartment, make sure that a compartment created inside of a compartment cannot have more authority than uh, than and then, then it's parent. Right. Um, uh, so uh, it, so for 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 the use case that JF just explained, and and also, um, uh, I think to make this all more palatable, well. I think just in order to make things more orthogonal when they can be, I highlighted line five that came from the XS behavior, uh, which is that a call on the compartment constructor throws 
if the frozens are, if the primordials are not frozen. Uh, I want to discuss here deleting that line. I think we should delete it, um, which will make more work for the XS guys, uh, because then uh, uh, if this whole thing becomes normative, they would have to support the compartment API both uh, for full JavaScript as well as for SES. Uh, but I think that there's really nothing else in this proposal that depends on the intrinsics being frozen. I think, um, um, and, and, and maybe I've lost part of the thread of the narrative here, but we have this notion, um, and it's one of the things that kicked us out of the, the sort of track we were on with the original Frozen Realms proposal, which was the notion of, you want to apply your various uh, polyfills and shims and whatnot, and then lock the environment down before you launch the application code. And mm -hmm. um, um, what, what uh, Modable has done is essentially they've done their version of that, and that's what you were born with. Um, um, uh, and it strikes me that um, since a, um, uh, I suspect that you can successfully remove that line and then they can in their implementation essentially do what that line says and still be spec compliant because you can always be um, in a world where the, the environment has been configured in some way where everything is, is, is frozen and if you try to do something that, that that is in 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 conflict with that, it'll it'll throw, um, and so this is essentially making that an early error, um, and I, I I so I don't think your proposal is problematic, but I think it does warrant some additional explanation around the edges. Did that make okay. sense? Uh, that made sense, uh, and if there is no. Uh, further re um, uh, reasons not to remove the line. I'm about to hit delete. You might want to leave yourself a note <laughs> to say, uh, but, 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 yeah. The only comment I would make is if you had decided to keep it, you might want to move it even earlier in the algorithm to have an early bailout so you don't instantiate this uh, new import map um, unnecessarily. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. We're sort of recapitulating the ES3 spec drafting here. How is it, how is it recapitulating ES3? The ES3 spec was, was derived from the notes from Microsoft's reverse engineering of the Netscape JavaScript implementation. So the spec started out as a description of the implementation as it existed and then uh, was kind of massaged to 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 try to take out the things which were merely artifacts of implementation, um, uh, and to just retain the things which were fundamental. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that's an important point. Yeah. Now, um, is do we know all of the implication of removing that line? Are we uh, and and now I. I see this as maybe some kind of invariant uh, that a compartment can only be used in a um, in a frozen environment, um, a little bit like an invariant that is uh, imposed on a proxy, uh, just to prevent uh, misuse or uh, prevent a proxy to be lying. In this case, I don't want to. Maybe I don't want to have a compartment that could be lying about its uh, capacity to isolate. Uh, I think that's actually, I think actually what, what JF said is right. I think that's capturing what the essential intent of that line was. It was merely being overly specific. So I don't understand it yet. Yeah, so um, a compartment uh, uh, used in a, an environment where the intrinsics are not frozen will not provide isolation. That's correct. And what that line is, is doing is making sure that it cannot be used 
in an environment that is not frozen. Okay, so what is so there's what is no it? there's there's no way to misuse it the same way is, um, is a proxy. Yeah, freezing or isolation because I, I mean freezing is one way to um, ensure that that ways to break isolation are not available. But I think the important thing is isolation. So I still don't understand what this would be accomplishing. Um, uh, the if you're in a non-frozen uh, realm, a realm with the where the intrinsics are not frozen, then uh, everything you do is suspect. Um, uh, including anything you do that's claiming not to be suspect. True, um, uh, but take um, but suspect and isolated is different. Um, if I use a proxy on a frozen object, I cannot make um, a frozen object appear to ah. be non-frozen, right? Okay. Okay. Now, so now there's I a set. There's a set of invariants that um, okay. prevent misuse, and it's it might be okay to lift them in in this case, I but see. I am not sure that it's it's correct. I'm I'm questioning. Okay, okay. Now now I understand. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and put the line back, and. Well, you might want to move it up, as I mentioned a moment ago. Yeah, I'll do that. Hold on. I'll do that. Now, although the things at the top is... Oh, yeah, right. right. We have this little bit more. Yeah, it's a, it's a bigger question. Yeah, you want to exit early if uh, conditions are not met. Too high. <laughs> yeah, just move the... Uh, after after three after the current three because you need the intrinsics to be defined oh. <laughs> yeah i was going to raise another point about that in a moment but i'll let you finish your comments here Now, um, as a way to implement it, it might be difficult, um, but uh, we should be able to have uh, a communication between Harden and uh, whatever we use to put to freeze the intrinsic and have that yeah. available to, to the uh, compartment. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, yeah. In, uh, this is why the way I had written it is there's uh, Call a host operation that will define <laughs> if the uh, intrinsics are frozen, and then leave it leave that up to the implementer. And what um, uh, Access is doing is they have a flag that they can reliably um, uh, query, and uh, that flag is only set if the intrinsics have been frozen. Okay, right. So, that, so good. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's that's a big big thing that I completely forgot to talk about, which is the full proposal for TC39 has to explain how a JavaScript realm becomes a CES realm, and therefore has to explain how the intrinsics, how you come to have a frozen set of intrinsics, and whatever else the, the properties are. That distinguish a JavaScript, a normal JavaScript realm from a CES realm. Um, and since uh, uh, CES no longer depends on the concept of multiple realms, uh, that has to be an explanation of how you do that transformation from the inside rather than how JavaScript code creates a, a separate CES realm. Uh, so none of that is covered in this API. And the reason none of that is covered in this API uh, is again because of the modularity of concepts uh, that we inherited from XS, 
uh, that we like, um, uh, which is there's really two separable issues, uh, which is if you're starting with JavaScript, how do you, how do you uh, come to be in CES? Uh, and then uh, if you're, once you're in CES, what do things look like? And if you're just building a specialized CES machine, as XS did, then you want to keep those two things decoupled so that this is simply the API that you see once you're in the CES world. It doesn't explain how you came to be in a CES world. So that yeah, makes sense. In, 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 in given that, I'm wondering about this, this line of code we've been discussing. Um, in the case of XS, how could how could that exception ever be thrown? If 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 the only way to be there is is via a a, a path that that you know ensures that this is true, what does what is it checking for? JF, I think this one's for you. Um, I believe that uh, in a um, um, CES has a mode where you don't have to be frozen. So um, that's something I'm currently looking at this uh, deeper into, into the system. And, and I have to do the groundwork because we, uh, the folks at Marvel are, are, are extremely busy these days. But um, there is, um, in, in their module system, everything is based on module. Um, they have uh, evaluators, they have, um, pre-compiled uh, binary modules, but they also have the capacity to uh, use source code. So uh, there's done quite a few modes of CES, of, 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 uh, of uh, access. And I believe that the, uh, the compartment API, there's, I haven't seen anything that conditionally expose the compartment API when uh, CES, uh, when uh, access is, is starting. Uh, in a non-frozen world. So, um, because they have two, uh, two modes, uh, then they want to make sure that uh, if the compiler API is ever uh, referenced, then it's going to be uh, in a frozen world. What we thought of doing in the in the in the, the, in our implementation of SAS is only put the compartment constructor on the global once the intrinsics have been frozen as a way to um, achieve the same benefit of not having a compartment use when something is not uh, frozen when the when the world is not frozen. Sorry to interrupt, um, but uh, since we're talking about um, the uh, intrinsics or the you know primordials, um, I, I was thinking uh, you know there are these internal slots of, of those actual um, constructors, um, and we sort of create this um, facade over them. Um, and, and those become the global objects. Um, would it make sense to say that uh, across compartments, you might want a built-in um, normative approach to take the same internals and wrap them with a new version of the prototypes? So, so it's it's what gets wrapped around the um, the internal uh, constructor itself so that two compartments can have two object constructors um, referring to the same um, internal constructor, uh, but the prototypes for both are completely separate. So I, I don't know if I, um, you know, jump in um, and explained it or <laughs> not really, but yeah. Uh, 
I, I did not, I, I think I understood the wiring you're talking about. I didn't understand what it accomplishes. Um, I, I think it takes a lot of manual, um, um, you know, manual work to accomplish that right now. Um, and if it's a standardized um, thing to do, um, then it, it could be exposed somehow and used, um, then, then we don't have to manually be doing that work. Um, I'm sorry, ma manually be doing what work? Like, like not manually, but I mean, um, when we're creating a compartment, um, we are we are wrapping uh, the the intrinsics, or are they just done in the realm? Like oh, what, what no? What what I'm proposing here is that we just have a, a you know exposed um, object, um, which we're defining here, which is that the uh, compartment constructor um, uh, is a an exotic object with that whose only special thing is this internal parent slot. Uh, and then a compartment instance uh, is an exotic object with, with these six slots, five of which are borrowed from the existing realm record mm -hmm. that, um, and then uh, it's, we just substitute the, the compartment uh, instance exotic object for all occurrences of realm records. So it just becomes the new realm record. It's not wrapping anything. Oh, okay, yeah. So, so yeah, maybe, maybe this is not the right point um, for what I'm trying to get at, but um, yeah, so, so I guess I'm warming up. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Um, right. uh, with regard to prototypes, uh, one of the things I did here is I followed the sort of the standard pattern, which is there's also an, an a, um, intrinsic object that comes in with this proposal called compartment prototype. That's not exotic, it's a plain object but um, uh, the compartment constructors dot prototype is that that prototype object and when the compartment constructor makes a compartment instance it makes the compartment instance uh, inheriting from the prototype so just the normal wiring there and then the further part of that normal wiring is um, the compartment prototype object has the new built-in methods that uh, or built in accessor properties that are coming in with this proposal. So this is where the, re the remainder of the API of this proposal comes in. So it's worth going through that, um, uh, which is from a compartment instance, just provide directly provide an accessor property uh, for getting at its global object. Uh, that's pretty much always been part of our notion of a compart of a realm instance api now a compartment instance api so uh, um, i must see here before we move to the next one because i think i was i was talking more about the global this so so the global this we get at this point it will have um it will have global constructors um at this point or do the global constructors get populated at some point on a fresh global this uh, uh, the, the global, cons yeah, the, the, the global this does get populated and where it gets populated is uh, starting at, at line 11 here uh, in the constructor. So we make the new global over here with, you know, object create, create an object that inherits from object prototype. Uh, and then uh, in line 11, uh, we basically go through all of the normal uh, global intrinsics, the global named intrinsics. Uh, that's how I'm interpreting line 11. Um, uh, the, the, so all the global named intrinsics, which are per realm rather than per compartment, and therefore excluding global this eval, the function constructor and the compartment constructor itself. Um, and, but we, so we just initialize those. And then we do the further initialization uh, of the things that are uh, per compartment, the eval function and the eval function and the function and compartment constructors, uh, and then finally, um, the global this object just pointing at itself. Um, uh, so that's where the global object gets initialized. Uh, 
And um, then whoever called new compartment, by the time they get their compartment instance object, it's pointing at a, glo a, glo you know, a, a global object that already has been initialized in exactly that way. Yeah, and, and that, that's a global object of this particular compartment that does not get like any kind of um, um, shared state other than the fact that, uh, sorry, so to clarify the object constructor itself in that global this uh, will be wrapping the realms internal um, object constructor, but it will have a separate prototype at this point or no? From another compartment? Uh, uh, I, I think the answer is no, but I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, you will have the same prototype. Uh, so prototypes are the same everywhere, so we preserve identity continuity between um, okay, perfect. between compartments. Yeah. Now, now, now that, that figures, just the function constructor will be different, that's all. Exactly, exactly. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, oh, I know oh. prototypes are, are very intertwined, so I'm wondering just... Yeah. Yeah. Got so it. one of the one of the uh, also one of the other constraint of the uh, the SES world, and it's something I haven't uh, uh, looked deeply into how it's done in in Excess, is that the uh, prototype constructor cannot be called uh, cannot be callable because there's only one set of prototype for for those things. So. For the four right. uh, items we we concerned with, the four function constructors, um, one of the things that uh, we've always done in, in our shims, and, and this should be part of the proposals in some way, is that those things are not callable. Yeah, because so yeah. the prototype of the object global, uh, I believe, is function global. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Function dot prototype. Function global prototype. So, so here I just saw this um, anomaly that you're going to have a function prototype, and you're bringing in an object prototype that inherits from another function prototype. Uh, so I'll tell you where this comes up that I completely overlooked. Comes up in the it, that needed to come up in this document that I completely overlooked, which is the compartment prototype object. Um, is, is the, the, the compartment prototype object itself is per realm, not per compartment. I yes. should have stated that explicitly um, uh, because we're creating a compartment constructor per compartment, but they all point at the same compartment prototype object. Uh, but uh, the additional thing that was the more egregious omission is on the compartment prototype object, what is the value of its constructor property. And it should be like the value of the constructor property on function prototype. It mm -hmm. should point at a function that only throws. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so by making it an, uh, you know, a throw only function, it doesn't really matter which reference you have. Okay, yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's not usable. So climbing up the prototype chain should not be allowed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it's allowed, but it's not. It doesn't lead to anything useful for those those constructors. Point out in passing the uh, uh, the the saying that the the just saying the realm record is now the compartment object uh, is following along in story tradition of um, JavaScript evolving by having um, spec defined abstractions being reified as um, API. Uh, Alex Vincent has his hand up. I don't know if he meant that. I did. I wanted to raise one small point where I mentioned where I saw a bug in the algorithm above on the previous page. Oh, okay. Um, on lines on on line number six. New target hasn't been defined anywhere in this algorithm. Ah, so that is, um, I, uh, JF, correct me if I got this wrong, but I believe that uh, there's boilerplate, 
uh, text in, or, or there's text that explains the boilerplate uh, in the ECMAScript spec such that within the documentation of any constructor, uh, new target is this weird special thing. Um, uh, and the weird special thing it refers to is um, uh, the constructor that, that it was originally invoked on. Uh, or in the case of the reflect.construct, the third argument to reflect.construct. It's also the thing that in the syntax is reified as the special form, uh, new dot target. Uh, so JF, am I following the normal spec convention of just using it as an identifier without explaining it? Yeah, uh, this is an area that the spec is, is a little bit loose. Sometimes new target is passed in as a parameter. Sometimes it's a uh, slot. And sometimes it's, um, it's something that's usually in the preamble. Like when we, when we see here, when the component constructor's construct is called with options, blah, 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 there's usually a mention of what new target is at, at that point. But it's, it's usually a, a um, something that doesn't need to be specified because we all know what it is. Objection withdrawn. <laughs> but yeah, let's, I'm, I'm, uh, let's make sure yeah. we have it. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's uh, yeah, put a note on it, we'll, we'll, we'll clarify it. Just make sure that it's consistent with most of the specs. Okay. It could so be added. just adding a line, like in some, in some places it's there, let new target uh, be get new target. And that, that's- Oh. It. Yeah. Uh, I, I which, which is weird because then get new target becomes equally mysterious. Right. That it's doesn't not, it's actually a, explain. Yeah, this, it's an abstract operation that is actually explained. That says, uh, get the this environment, et cetera. Yeah. So this is how you detect whether or not a function is called with new or not, right? So you say if yes. the target is not. Yeah. 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 It's when you, because you, uh, uh, you know, I, I, we had something in the spec somewhere, in, in other set of spec, which is, the constructor is intended to be used as uh, with new, and if it's used as a function, it throws. Yeah, yeah, and and also it's good for classes when you want to know if it's being inherited, you know, extended, or it's the actual constructor itself, right? So I, I put that in the chat, the class example. Okay, so I added the constructor property, uh, not using spec language, but but using um, uh, just the just just an explanation to remind us of what the issue is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And when I introduce the compartment prototype, I did remember to say shared intrinsic. So that's good. Uh, so the um, so the rest this of is this, very nice. The um, so the rest of this is um, uh, the uh, XS compartment made visible the import map, and to my and to my mind that was a violation of virtualizability. Uh, if I'm sitting in a virtual address space, uh, I can probe to see what virtual address, addresses I might be able to dereference, um, you know, by whether I get a page fault or not or whatever, and adding a query for that doesn't violate any important principle. Um, but being able to know what physical addresses those virtual addresses map to is just a complete abstraction violation. Uh, and it kills virtualizability because then 
uh, if I'm run in a, an equivalent virtual machine that's mapped to an underlying machine differently, suddenly I can detect that. Uh, so I think um, the same thing co comes up here in um, exposing the import map. So what I'm proposing to expose here is some way to just expose the set of keys that you can, the set of absolute specifiers that are honored uh, 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 by imports in this compartment. Uh, Mark, I, I, I am not sure of that. Um, and because uh, what they call uh, the map is not what import.map is about. It's something different. Oh. So they call it uh, dot map. It looks like import dot map, but it's different. It's a, it's it is a map, but it's a map between a string to a symbol. And what's its uh, purpose? Its purpose is maybe I can paste the link here just in a sec. So I do have a question here. Um, we've consistently seen people wishing to ship a resolve API. Yes. Uh, yeah. Would this be affected by that? Uh, so, um, so we need, uh, I haven't figured out where that goes in here yet. Uh, yeah, it doesn't we'll exist. Work. Yeah. Uh, that's that's definitely a something that we need to do as part of this. We need to figure out where the resolve API goes, uh, and the way the way the absence of that shows up here is that uh, this spec only talks about absolute specifiers. It's completely silent on any control of how relative specifiers are mapped to absolute specifiers. Yeah. So um, if you click on the link I have on the side, it will be a little bit more understandable. Um, it's it they really have a, a subset of, of the map. So the link on, on in the chat by Mark. Regarding the resolve API, I ask this because uh there's increasing attempts to land a resolve API within Node itself for ES mm -hmm. modules. And mm -hmm. it would be good if somebody could iterate on all the constraints of the compartment yeah. API so we could exactly try to sort it. Because yeah. Yeah. So there is an we, we open stopped. PR as of today to <laughs> okay. ship one. Could you point to send us, yeah. us a link? Let That'd me, be great. Let me put it in chat. There is also an open discussion issue on it, but this has come up several times. And okay. here we are again. Okay, very good. So if you have things that you need discussed, please put it either on the PR if it's regarding implementation or the discussion issue that is linked below. That's awesome. Yeah, we were talking about uh, going back to this import method so, specification. And, um, you'll and notice this PR hangs it off import meta. Um, so you should probably comment however you wish. <laughs> Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. I, <laughs> exactly. One, right. One question. I, one question about the resolve and, and compartment specifically. Um, are we saying resolve is something that happens on behalf of a compartment or through the compartment? Because I believe a compartment um, is, you know, something that you put together for a function. Then you 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 know it supersedes it that you resolve on its behalf, like. That's an external hook, like an iframe. Um, you know, you resolve what the iframe is requesting. You don't let the iframe handle its own resolution. Um, you know, here we're talking about the service worker approach, right? Um, so, so I think it helps to to say whether or not you want the compartment itself to be aware of the resolve happening, or for it to actually be the external facing API. Um, that that gets called, but you know, on behalf of the compartment, not not from within it. So so let me so let me try out something. I did have a thought about where to put the the uh, the resolve hook. 
which is, um, uh, so let me just, I'll just make a concrete proposal that if the options bag uh, has a member named resolve uh, whose value is a callable function, uh, then, um, uh, it, it re then, uh, then to resolve a relative specifier to an absolute specifier, um, uh, the platform, you know, for code running in this compartment, you know, in the compartment that this constructor makes. So, okay, uh, let, me, let me rephrase all that. This compartment constructor um, is making a compartment instance. If the options bag given to the constructor contains a resolve hook, then um, it creates a compartment such that when code in that compartment imports using a relative specifier, that resolve hook is called to turn the relative specifier into an absolute specifier. And then once you have an absolute specifier, then that's further translated through the import maps, which this spec is not silent on. Um, uh, does that does that factoring of relative versus absolute and where to put the resolve hook make sense? Uh, I think this satisfies the the concern that uh, Sala just raised, which I think is quite important, which is the compartment that's made has no control over its resolve hook or even seeing it. It's that the compartment that makes it gets to determine what the resolve behavior is of the compartment that it makes. That seems reasonable. There are other hooks you may wish to get to eventually, but for resolve, that seems fine. Brandon, uh, do you have uh, some use cases we could take a look at of what, what, uh, how people are trying to, to what they're trying to do? Um, so we have a lot from nodes loaders. Um, okay. That's big, broad. Um, in particular, code generation from strings, similar to an evaluator, is pretty common. Uh, that's for doing any kind of transforms. Uh, and that means we have to identify different format types. So determining the format that you're about to work with is also important because just getting a string back is insufficient. Um, so there are multiple module types being discussed all around. There's JavaScript built-in modules, there's HTML modules, CSS modules, JSON modules, WASM modules, WASI modules, ES modules, and common JS modules. Those are the big ones. And people are translating from most of those formats into WASM or ES modules. And so you have to have a way to differentiate the source text being sent to you and mm -hmm. a list of acceptable um, eventual formats that are supported. This is a long discussion. I don't think it's worth our time right here. Okay. The certainly, fine. Cer you, certainly uh, this spec, even with the resolve hook, remains silent on non-ECMAScript modules. And I think that's fine. I think, I think to go to, to propose something for stage two, we should have the resolve hook. But I think it's fine for stage two to, at this point, still be silent on coexistence with non-ECMAScript modules. I uh, just wanted to bring people's attention to the chat. Um, Jackworks was asking and Zala if there's links to the evaluator shim that we can make public. Um, and specifically what the status of implementation of all of this was. So uh, JF, the evaluator shim repository that you're working on, is that a public or private repository? That's been public for two months. Okay, could you just paste a link to it? Mm -hmm. It's on the uh, Agoric uh, environment.
Okay, good. It's called, I just basically it's called, called, yeah. called evaluators. And, and, yeah, and it has not yet been aligned with this document, but the idea is that we're going to do that quickly. Yes, and there's there's a fair there's been two there's been it's an evolution. It's a simplification of realm um, at at the first stage, and then there's uh, about a month ago I did another uh, refactor, which was um, to get into a clearer sp uh, split between RAM record and and evaluator, and getting closer to the specs in terms of perform eval and, and, and all of that. So we have fewer uh, concepts like a, f uh, uh, a factory of factories and things like that. So it's, it's a lot simpler. Um, so one further thing on the uh, API proposed here. Uh, I'll revisit this whole import set versus import map things. I think I just yeah. completely misunderstood what was going on. Um, uh, but uh, then there's the various uh, things that cause evaluation. And there are three different <laughs> distinct dimensions of variation, um, uh, two of which are orthogonal to each other uh, that I was trying to capture here. And I was trying to capture it not with parameters, even though there's some, there's some orthogonality, because they're static concepts. It doesn't make sense for one string to evaluate one way uh, sometimes and, uh, and another way another time. So I wanted a, a separate method name uh, for each kind of evaluation, uh, but I wanted a naming convention uh, to show what the relationships are. So the first split is um, module versus script. And if you're a module, there's no further splits. Um, if you're a script, uh, you can uh, evaluate as strict code or as sloppy code. Um, and I wanted to bring that out explicitly rather than, um, uh, than what the current eval function does, uh, which is always execute sloppy. Uh, uh, and then um, un unless there's a use strict directive in the source file. Um, uh, that mean, you know, the, the problem with that, especially when you look at XS, uh, is that that requires the virtual machine to support sloppy mode, at least to the extent of running until, you know, or, 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 or rather of parsing and recognizing the directive. Uh, and if you're just trying to build a strict only machine, you shouldn't need to do that. So, um, so there's sloppy versus strict. Um, uh, there's um, uh, something that's very obscure that I have generally forgotten um, in previous generations of this, uh, which is running code, evaluating code as what the spec calls eval code versus running the code as global code. Um, so uh, in the so so the so the only reflective way of running code that the language provides for is um, uh, running code as eval code using eval or the function constructor. Um, uh, however, when, the, when you have, let's say, a script tag with a script in the browser or a, the .js file that, uh, actually, I don't know what the situation with node, so I won't speak to that, but, in the, but the script in the browser, um, uh, it's not running as if it's a, it's a string being evaluated by eval. Uh, the difference is uh, what happens to top level variable and function declarations. Um, uh, in uh, one of the modes, they become global properties that are born configurable 
in the other mode, they're, they turn into global pop properties that are born non-configurable, and I don't remember which is which. So that's the case if it's a uh, uh, script versus slot versus, um, I'm sorry, if it's a script uh, uh, where we're talking about, sorry, if it's a sloppy script, then I've just described the difference between um, uh, global versus eval. If it's a strict script, then when evaluated as global code, it's global proper, it's top level var and function declarations uh, become again properties on the global object configured somehow. Uh, and if it's a strict script evaluated as eval code, it's top level var and function declarations do not become global properties. They're just local to that evaluation. Um, and it's just unfortunate that we have that explosion of evaluation kinds, but we do. And I think uh, multiplying them to create a bit of an explosion of method names uh, is something that is, that is, you know, as long as the explosion is moderate, which it is, I still think that's better than trying to do it by dynamic parameters. I think there's one more thing, but I, we have to verify it. Like I believe I verified that two weeks ago and I forgot. Um, it also imports in a script are relative to the SRC. They are not relative to the um, base URL. So, so when, when there is an import statement in um, script code, um, one of the options you would want to pass to the eval is the SRC. And, and, okay. and so okay. dynamic imports relative to the SRC would be um, something um, that will change okay. with that option. Okay, that's interesting because obviously there's, uh, for eval code right now in the language, um, there are no other parameters you can pass. So it can't be relative to a source. So that, that's, that makes sense. Um, yeah. So that wouldn't, so that I, would. Yeah. So, 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 so that, that, that's from the script tag when I give it an SRC attribute. I believe that uh, factors into um, the relative dynamic import calls from this SRC uh, location, basically. So, okay. so if we're going to be synthesizing this by a function call, then it probably should be able to emulate the script tag. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's, I that's... Go ahead. Uh, I, I, I think the, the, uh, Factoring out as a set bunch of separate methods is, or it might be the best of a, a bad set of alternatives. Um, I will acknowledge it is, but ugly. Um, and I'm very concerned about the difficulty of explaining it. Um, and part of the problem is what you're capturing is a bunch of underlying subtle distinctions. And the problem is that those distinctions, first of all, that they exist. Uh, but then second of all, they need to be explained. I think the particular naming you've got here has a bunch of different non-orthogonalities in it that make it additionally confusing and perhaps unnecessarily so. You've got run versus eval, you've got script versus module versus expression, you've got sloppy versus strict versus doesn't say anything about it. Um, um, and it, 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 it feels like a, a, a muddled jumble. Um, yeah. Now, the underlying reality is a muddled jumble, so that's not actually that weird, but it now becomes our problem. Yes. Um, one thing that and I also, like to add. Also, when we go to some platform like Mutable, not all of those things might be possible, so um, Precisely. that rest yeah. restrict their uh, capability of being spec compliant. Right. So one thing I would suggest is that if a platform does not support one of these combinations, it simply does not define the function. So you can tell the difference between a thrown exception and one that actually is not supported. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And that, that fits with the normal JavaScript feature detecting convention, yeah. which is mm -hmm. an absent feature corresponds to a detectably absent property. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's now, um, when we design a compartment API, we want to um, make things that are common uh, easy and things that are uh, accessory possible. Um, and, and, and it's a way to say that we want to design an API and, and express something that looking at the API, the recommended way of using the API is obvious. Um, I wonder if we need to bring all of that legacy with it, considering that the world moving forward is mostly centered around modules. And modules have only strict mode, and that simplifies everything. Mm. Having compartment, a concept that only relates to modules, is probably sufficient to ex to to achieve the overall objective of CES, which is uh, have something to express plopola uh, at a very granular level. And at the same time, not, not having to carry all of this reduces uh, implementation, barrier to implementation, documentation, tests, and uh, it just leads to people say, okay, the new world is all about modules. That, that has a, a lot of uh, aesthetic and intuitive appeal to me. Um, I, 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 I generally am in favor of things that involve jettisoning uh, baggage. Um, I am a little nervous it's about <laughs> legacy code support, um, um, and whether 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 running legacy code is going to even be a thing in this world because this world is going to be have so many other things that are new that we might as well do just what you said. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, Mark was is pushing for being more more uh, rigorous about virtualizability, and I'm wondering if that might enter into into this discussion yeah. as well. So, so, so let me just give give an example where virtualizability would push for more of this API rather than less, uh, which is um, uh, the test of virtualizability is whether on one host you can emulate another host such that code running under the emulated host really for most purposes um, thinks it's code running on, you know, running on the host being emulated. So uh, if you're going to, for example, emulate a browser, then you would like some straightforward straightforwardly correct thing to do with the content contents of, of uh, script tags. Um, and, and also the debug console is a good example of something that you kind of need the, the legacy compatibility to provide something that emulates what a deb developer environment looks like right now. Yes. Um, uh, Chip just brought up a point of order, time check. Uh, we've generally been trying to stop sharply at three. Uh, so that nobody feels like they need to over schedule their day to attend. Uh, my inclination is to continue to do that. Um, so are we at a coherent enough stopping point that now uh, with the understanding that we're going to re resume on this topic um, that we can adjourn this meeting? I like that. Yeah, definitely. I, I have I have other things I need to do today, which are <laughs> relevant. Yeah, I did. Yeah, and and the and the the bag of all the values is a big topic by itself. So yeah. Okay. It, it deserves so, attention. So Michael, following our normal convention, before people drop off, can you turn off recording? Yes.